Okay, so this half we'll do pestilent diseases, and it is going to overrun by a little bit again. And I've mentioned several of the kind of key points in the earlier half, and that's things like anticipation. So if you've got an idea about the life cycle of a plant and what to do roughly when, then you can also anticipate what you're going to be needing to do in the future. And yeah, this is in a context where uh, there is such a thing as beginner's luck. When you first start growing, if, you, if your soil hasn't been used for a long while and nobody much has grown much in the, in the environs nearby, then you're not likely to get many pestilent diseases. And it uh, might be only in the longer term that certain pestilent disease build up. So there's a bit of a honeymoon period. And before you experience some of these pests and diseases, you don't need to know about them. And then when you find out about them, they can be a bit de devastating. Anybody had that experience? Yeah. So before you, before you, yeah, there's maybe thousands of potential p pests and diseases. Have we got that book with the pictures in? With the gory pictures in? It's down here. That one under there, Mike. Uh, black and white pictures from the 1950s of some of the most horrendous, gothic, horrible distortions of growth possible. They're all in black and white. But yeah, if you want to scare yourself, have a look in there. And this really refers to a whole approach to growing, which I'd call pathological. So that's thinking about yeah, uh, what problems might happen. And there are some experts who specialise just in diagnosing what's on this leaf and where did it come from and what's wrong with it. But the whole uh, ethic of this course is to try and propose uh, positive health for plants and people and therefore almost overcompensating. And so my experience, my apology, is I don't know much about this subject. Having had fairly good practices, a lot of the horrible diseases and pests in there I've not come across. But uh, I've got this list in a booklet, which hopefully I'll get onto in a minute, and that will summarise the ones which I have experienced, and you are likely to experience at some point if you pursue. Um, so, yeah. yeah. One point about if you're buying in stuff or raising stuff, it's this difference between hard-grown and pampered. And your friend who said she grows her parsnips in the greenhouse, well, there's no actual need to give them the extra heat. They'll still germinate outdoors. And it's trying to make a judgment, again, about uh, when you can allow your plants to yeah, survive on their own and take root on their own. Can you pass me that other green one? Um, yeah, this is, what's his name? Alec Bristow. <coughs> and this is where he's done a whole analogy on plants like children. So it's called How to Bring Up Your Plants. And it is, oh, they're babies and they need their nappy changing. But pretty soon it's, no, they're, they're, they're adolescent and they're teenagers and you don't want them under your feet and you want them to go off and do their own thing. And that's one th theory of parenting and plant raising. Uh, yeah. yeah, one more point to add to what I've said before and that is, yeah, uh, <coughs> if you try and analyse, like I say, the pathology of it, where is the disease or pest come from, uh, they're, yeah, it's trying to be honest with yourself in terms of what have you done with your way when you should have been watering or was it something that you did. Um, but yeah, the story to illustrate this, it's thinking about uh, different factors. So that, that there's often more than one factor. So things like temperature, rainfall, soil quality, those are the big factors. But I'm specifically thinking about uh, vectors. And vector is something that carries from one place to another, a carrier. And the conclusion, I'll do the conclusion first, uh, is, yeah, very often <coughs> what we're talking about is a combination of different factors. So very rarely is it, yeah, if I get stung with a bee or a wasp, I, I can work out which one it was. Um, but yeah, in plant terms, uh, yeah, a, a good question that people ask is, you get um, a sooty mould growing on your fruit plants. On the young leaves in early summer, so it's not spring, but early summer, and people, and even the experts, haven't got a clue often. And what happens is, uh, yeah, a, there are aphids on a plant, 
And very often on the young growth in spring, uh, it's very soft, sappy growth, and the aphids are flying around and they'll find that. So first aphid problem, but you don't notice the aphids because they don't actually damage the tree. But then what happens is the ants come along and they milk the aphids and they create herds of aphids and they move them around the plant. The ants will move aphids around a plant, put it on new growth, and then what happens is they're trying to milk the sap or the excretia, basically, out of the aphids. And that's sugary. And so there's all this sugary sap around and some of it falls on the leaves beneath where the aphids are. And that's why you get a black mould, because they get sugar solution on the leaf, and then the mould, which is just in the atmosphere, lands on the sugar, and is used in the sugar, and turns it black. Can we turn that off now, John? Mm -hmm. Cheers. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you wouldn't be able to work out, just from seeing a black leaf, and seeing mould on it, where it's come from, <coughs> but that might be a solution. So, it's not just a causal one-to-one -one relationship, it's a few aphids, and then having the ants. And then having the mould, which actually is what you can see as a problem. <coughs> the problem wasn't mould, it was the ants and the aphids that was actually the problem. Uh, so that's just illustrating, yeah, it can be um, a combination of various factors that combine that actually cause the problem. And uh, before I get into the slides today, it's going to be a little consideration of our friends, the Slugs and Snails. And I have had, met, yeah, many people talk on and on and on about slugs and snails, they're slug bores, because these are the people who haven't, haven't cleared their site first, and haven't, haven't thought ahead, or haven't done it early enough, and then, yeah, losing young seedlings is the worst case scenario, so you sow, and then you lose a whole row. Uh, yeah, there was one bloke, he was the one who'd, uh, yeah, heard about compost, and so to his credit he'd start to make some compost, but he hadn't made it very well or hadn't left it long enough. And immature compost is food for slugs. And they're actually one of the things which break down compost material and process it into something that is more usable later on. So what, what he'd done is he'd actually created a slug farm, which he called a compost heap. And then in his uh, desire to fertilize the ground and the crops, he'd spread this compost around the garden taking all the slugs' eggs and distributing them all around his garden. <laughs> and then <laughs> he got so perturbed, he was the one who he was out at night with a torch, kept his missus awake, and he found there was a website called IHateSlugs.com. <laughs> that was about five years ago. He's been a long-term subscriber. But yeah, rather than let it get out of proportion, I like to annoy people uh, during the growing season, and they come along and moan at slug, about slugs, and I say, oh, I haven't seen any slugs. Uh, well, I do see some slugs. But if we can start taking care of them now, and simply mm -hmm. enough, that's, yeah, we've got planks of wood dotted around the sides. They've been there all winter. And just turning those planks over now, in the spring, when it's warm enough, oh, there's all the little slugs hiding. And if you can catch the big slugs, the mother slugs, then that's worth a thousand points, because mm -hmm. they'd otherwise produce a thousand little babies. <laughs> but yeah. The very simple approach, and it does apply across the board to some of these other pests, is put yourself in their mind, uh, or imagine you're a slug. And what do you want? You want slimy, wet, dark. So under the plank, that's perfect for them. And then that's actually attracting them as a hiding place, but then you turn it over and eradicate your slugs. And I'm allowed to just stamp on them, because I've... I've helped so many slugs and fed slugs over the years. <laughs> but yeah, uh, some of us might be, want to be a bit more kind of cautious or remove them. If you do take them away, you've got to take them at least 100 foot away, because the big slugs and snails do have some kind of homing device and they can come back from 30 foot away. That kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, um, also thinking about what's the time of year? And very often in the spring, the pattern of growth, the pa pattern of the weather is we will get an easterly wind coming off the continent, and that might be throughout April, which means very often in April you've got warm weather, but it's dry, so you have to do extra watering, and you don't see any slugs, because it's dry. And then, when the rain comes in May, and your little seedlings have emerged successfully, that's when you get a bit of rain, and it's moist, 
and that's when the slugs can get about, and they can travel 10 metres easily in a night. So from over there to over here, no problem for them. So it's thinking about the weather pattern. So if, it does, if we do get that pattern dry and then wet, we can expect an emergence of slugs. Also, how long the days are relative to the night. And the, the, as the days get longer, nights get shorter, and there's less chance for slugs to get around and about. Um, I'll show you pictures in a minute, but yeah, snails, uh, they have a coating, yeah, a coating basically of, of calcium to make their shells. And that indicates that you have enough calcium in your soil and in your plot for snails to be able to form shells. That's a good sign because you've got calcium around. However, it's a bad sign because snails, that shell, allows them to climb up a plant uh, and stay in the sun, hot sun, all day. And that they almost bubble or almost boil, but they'll stay alive. And then they're in the right place to come and finish off your, your plants the next day. So analysing that kind of thing. And yeah, this balance between we want to encourage predators generally, which means wild spaces and things like nettles are good. But if they're a bit uh, messy and have got especially stones and rubble in amongst them, and any hiding place for slugs and snails, including classically around here dry stone walls. So anybody who's got a dry stone wall, uh, you want to watch out because that's where the slugs and snails will over overnight at least. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to imagine your site, going back to site and planning, and think where are my productive areas that I want to keep free of slugs and snails, and where are the sources of them, rubble, rubbish, uh, walls and that, and actually then to try and create some kind of zoning so that they can't go straight from their overnight uh, uh, stay over back to your back to your crops and again planks in the way would be helpful but yeah these four techniques here clear paths so if we're accepting raised beds we we'll start to put more raised beds that inevitably means having a path and if you keep your path clear that's harder for the slug to cross and you'll get to the edge of the path and find it's just dry yeah, subsoil or soil and you won't go further in that direction you'll turn back and find something else and that really does work. So if you imagine each of these tables is a raised bed, and I've walked a path around them, if the path is full of weeds, then that's a transmission route, and the slugs are going to get into your bed. But if they're kept clear, scraped clear, that's going to stop it. So that's another point that sometimes I just leave weeds in my path, and I try to encourage slugs when I haven't got crops in the bed. It doesn't matter. And then the slugs prefer dead, dying, diseased material. So they'll gather in the path, and then when I clear that material away, put it on the compost, I've got rid of the slugs and snails onto the compost. So clear paths being a first line of defence. The planks of wood, being, if you maintain them and look after them, are really good general uh, all-purpose use uh, to, to keep the slug and snail numbers down. Do they survive on the compost? Mm. So they might, it doesn't matter if they get made into compost. Maybe. But yeah. Um, They'll go away once the compost is finished. Um, and yeah, that's number three. But yeah, the plants of wood, one caution. If you take up this idea and it works for a bit, but then you neglect your planks, well, then you've created uh, slug maternity units where they'll breed and multiply. So if you leave it down for a month or more, you're actually creating a problem for yourself by allowing the slugs to hide. If you turn it over every week or twice a week and get rid of them all, then it's effective as a method. Uh, third method is this compost. That if you make good compost, uh, all the digestible food material in that for the slug has been uh, neutralised, is used up, is, is not present. Um, they, they'll digest rotting material, like I say, but when it's finished compost, they don't find any value in it. So if you had enough compost, the best slug control would be to constantly mulch every plant with compost. However, that's pointing out one of these drawbacks further down, that as soon as it rains, that compost is going to start to get washed away. And there's a whole load of what's called barrier methods with slugs that are recommended, which I don't think are worth bothering with, which include things like broken egg shells and copper wires that has a little charge, and they're supposed to not go over that, but of course they do. And if you get a big slug, like a mother atriplex, you know, frilly orange one, I don't think there's anything that's going to stop it. So, yeah, uh, beer traps is the other one. And that's beer mixed with water 50-50, not 
pure beer. I've tried things like wine. They're a bit fussy. They prefer beer. <laughs> they, working class. Slugs are working class. They're mm-hmm. proletarian slugs, yeah. <coughs> <coughs> and, yeah, they, they'd be attracted to like just jam and water, but it wouldn't have the alcohol in it. And the alcohol, possibly as well as intoxicating them, is what does the trick because it's the uh, difference in hygroscopic pressure. The, uh, compared to water, alcohol actually draws the water out of the slugs. So once they get down in the slug mixture, the beer, beer with water, uh, it's the alcohol which actually extracts moisture from the slugs, and that's what kills them off. And if anybody wanted to, oh, we've had the protest. It wasn't, wasn't, much, wasn't much of a protest, was it? But yeah, the horriblest thing to throw at somebody would be dead slugs mixed in the beer trap. It just honks, it's horrible, it's absolutely awful. Uh, one, that's reminding me of one, one, one little thought, which is relevant to the last, last point here. Uh, I did a course in the autumn, and uh, everyone yeah, kept at it. And then by the, yeah, by the session that I gave out plants, which is in two weeks' time for you lot, uh, I checked them all just to make sure there were big slugs in there. But there was a tiny little slug in one plant. Uh, and somebody who'd been through the course and been keen and you know, right onto it, they saw this slug and they almost jumped on the chair. And that's this thing about uh, yeah, getting used to these grotty things. I'm trying to expose you, at least in class, to some of the, uh, what do we call it? Um, yeah, the, the, hard, the hardcore reality. But yeah, collecting slugs, um, if you're collecting them by hand, you do get the slime on your fingers and underneath your fingernails, and it's very hard to get off. If you just wash your hands and it's got a bit of slug slime on it, it doesn't come off. Uh, however, if you use this technique and get a bit of soil in your fingers, rub it hard on the area that's got slug slime, that will rub it off. Abrasion. It'll actually take the slug slime off. So if you don't want to get the rough skin from that, you can dip your fingers in vinegar and wait for a few minutes. And will fix the protein and the slime to stop it taking its off. Excellent. Like Add vinegar on. Okay, so that was a little bit about slugs. Anybody want to confess or say anything about slugs? Can I just ask you what the dilution with the beer is? Is it like 50 50? 50 50, yeah, yeah. So, is it a quick death or is it a brutal? It's a happy death. Yeah. <laughs> it's suicide rather than murder. <laughs> <laughs> and they're good on the compost afterwards. Yeah. So, next up, I'm going to show you some pictures. Go on. Recycled wood to make raised beds, but it's going to have to be sort of built up. Now, in between each layer of wood, is that going to be a slug hiding place? So, in, back to raised beds, and the more sheer your sides can be, and the less hiding places and gaps, the better. Mm-hmm. Sometimes, yeah, if we're using certain wood, we might have two layers of wood, yeah. and try to block up the gap in between or something, uh, just so they can't hide in there. Mm-hmm. But yeah, wherever you create hiding places, if you know where they are and you can access them then you can find you know, the hiding places. But that's really a caution against using loose bricks or slates or something where there's lots of hiding yeah. places for slugs. Yeah. So designing them out, again, best solution. Let's have the light some pictures. And... Yeah, let's come back. So the first picture, possibly the most useful in terms of general uh, pest disease control, and this is rubbing colonies of aphids that have uh, grown on new potatoes. So these potatoes, they're in a polytunnel, so they're early, and also that means they're going to be warmer, and that will make them softer and sappier, and therefore more vulnerable to aphid damage. And Sue's just going around and rubbing, they'll be found on the youngest leaves where the shoot's emerging. So they won't be on the older leaves. Uh, And in this case, these potatoes have got big enough that the aphids can now jump from one leaf to the next and they'll colonise the whole of this patch. So we might try to stop them off a bit earlier if we see them, uh, but by the time they're all growing in a mass like this, that's when the danger can be that they'll proliferate. And just in a few days, you could have one aphid that multiplies because they're born parthenogenetically, which means they've already got pre-fertilised ge- next generation within them, for course sake. <laughs> and so, yeah, in the hot temperature, the long days in summer, they could actually multiply several times in one day or something ridiculous like that, and there'd be thousands of them within a week. 
and they'll climb across this crop. Uh, again, if we think ahead, uh, and we know that might be a problem, we can introduce ladybirds earlier on, say a month beforehand, and have the ladybirds, the predator, multiply, and then we've got enough ladybirds and lab ladybird larvae to help with that problem. But hand rubbing and inspection, and that's what I was saying from the very start about observing what's going on, noticing, oh, there's one aphid, instead of a couple of days later, oh, there's a thousand aphids. Oh. And there's a little aphid, uh, head end and uh, reproduction end. And here's ladybird that's just emerged from its casing, its pupil casing. That's a nice, it's lighter orange at that stage. It doesn't go red until it's got the sun and soft at that stage. And here's our beautiful friend, it's the ladybird larvae. And you might see this in a garden and you think, ooh, that's horrible and ugly. But note it's got the orange spots. I don't know whether the new harlequin variety of ladybird has extra spots as a, a larvae, but the new variety of ladybird is also a voracious predator of, of aphids. So we might have different ladybirds, but we've still got ladybirds. Uh, I think they'll be in balance. I don't think they'll be a problem. And then slug, and that's one of these orange frilly ones. Uh, and that is a mother slug. That's, that's going to produce young. But see what it's doing. Here's all this lovely new growth. It's not touching that. It's eating this manky old bit of onion here, the onion leaf or something that's died down. So again, they're after stuff that's rotting already. Here's a snail up on the plastic in a polytunnel, i.e. at height, baked in the sun, but it can stay there, and that's the advantage of having the house on its back. And another picture, this is after a drought. So a drought had just broken, first rain for ages. All these snails have suddenly emerged. This isn't on my side, by the way, it's somebody else's side. <laughs> and again, they're eating all the old vegetation rather than the new stuff that we might prefer. So there's another picture there. And then turning over a slug plank, and all these are little slugs underneath the plank. So we turn that over, just stomp on them. But like I say, if we leave it on too long, danger of they'll multiply under the plank. And then here's beer trap. It's also got a covering on it, in this case a plank, so that if it rains lots, the beer doesn't get diluted, so a cover. And then, if you notice, the, mix, the pot is uh, buried, but with a centimetre or more protruding above ground. And that's because, uh, and again, it's a classic that relates to other things, that uh, the slugs will climb over and climb in. But the problem is, if it's at ground level, ground beetles will fall in. And ground beetles eat slugs' eggs. So we don't want to remove our predator. And again, it's that ecological balance thing. By disrupting one bit, we could disrupt another. So that's just a note on leaving your beer traps protruding above ground. Uh, there's another one, not such a good example. And then another point about slugs is, uh, I don't mind cosmetic damage because I'm not selling my produce and it doesn't have to be perfect. And that, yeah, if I find a slug in something, I'll just remove it. If, if a customer finds a slug in something, they'll bring it back and sue us or they'll never come back again. So it's a different matter, home growing compared to commercial. But yeah, there are little slugs that have nibbled away at the outer, older leaves of this lettuce. But I've managed to protect the heart, and that's the bit, again, that I want to eat. So the older leaves were just to supply energy so that the young, succulent heart, the bit I want to eat, is okay. And we've done enough slug control that that's sound. So that is absolutely 100% fine, although it looks damaged cosmetically, the bit that I want to eat is still sound. So it's partly about our psychological approach to this and not being too fussy. Uh, I'm not eating slugs though, they taste bitter, whereas snails can be cooked and they're quite nice, like the Romans are. So here's Mr. Frog, or Mrs. Frog, and that picture actually of lots of tadpoles, and this was after a cold night, but on a hot sunny day. And all the tadpoles have bunched together and they formed a convex pattern which is actually focusing the sunlight to get them warmer. Incredible. Uh, but yeah, thinking about ponds generally, uh, worth installing a pond or having some standing water to attract frogs, but it might take two or three years for the frog population to build up in order to be meaningful and effective against your slugs. 
So this kind of, you don't expect it to kick in immediately the first time that one frog turns up. But once they've multiplied and two or three years down the line, you will get enough uh, young frogs emerging and uh, mature adults coming back to actually make an influence and knock out some of your slugs. Here's Mr. Frog again. And that's the next one. What's this picture here? Uh, it's a hedgehog. And similarly, uh, unless you've got a big garden, it's hard to engineer hedgehogs. They will be around. But all the normal cautions about, you know, check your bonfires before you, you set light and all that, and try to keep your, keep your hedgehogs going. Terrible unexposed picture, that's a lace wing. And on an aubergine leaf, that is attached at the pointy end. That's a hoverfly larvae. And hoverfly and lace wings, especially in the uh, larval stage, are also predators of aphids. So we want to keep them around. And one general recommendation is rather than tidy everything up too much, leaving a bit of clutter around, uh, and I'd say the same about spiders, like not tidying up. If you tidy up too much, all your spiders will get swept out, and then there'll be nothing to catch the flies. And similarly, uh, hoverflies and lace wings, uh, there are actually yeah, bug, bug stations that you can make out of little canes wrapped together and corrugated cardboard that do it. Here's the scariest one for me. And this is a problem with polytunnels and greenhouses, only in July and August, when it's really, really hot. So imagine it's about 20 degrees outside, it's about 30 degrees inside the polytunnel, and that's when this red spider mite becomes a real problem. And what's happened here is they're a smaller version of aphid, they just suck, suck sap from plants, which in itself is no problem, until you get about a billion on your plant. Yeah, and they're tiny, and there are millions and millions of them. You can see them crawling around. And they make this webbing and crawl around on that uh, and spread from plant to plant. This is actually a beetroot that's going to flower in the polytunnel. And I've missed this, and all this webbing around here, that's thousands and thousands of this red spider mite. And the problem with this one is you only see it in that really, really hot weather. So again, if we lived in a hot climate, we'd see this more often. Uh, and it's one of the ones where there are various methods of reducing its numbers early on, but the only effective control I found is rapeseed oil, again, diluted with water and sprayed on. And if you think yourself down to their scale, microscopic scale, when they get sprayed with a dilute solution of rapeseed oil, it's like being tarred and feathered. It's like you know, thick, gloopy to them. It stops them moving around, so it physically stops them. However, that's on the edge of organic uh, um, acceptability because if I spray some of the predators, some of the helpful insects with rapeseed oil, it'll kill or dis disrupt them as well. So it's a last resort, but that does work. And it's partly the yeah, uh, viscosity of the oil. And it's also that mustard has a bit of a bite to it and they don't like that. So that's red spider mite. Here's a, a slightly different proposition. This is not a, a pest, but it's the possibility of getting mildew on your grapes. And these bunches are really tight. This one, I've not removed enough of the fruits. And these ones in the middle haven't been able to swell up because there's just not enough space for them. They're pushing against each other. So it's an anticipation thing again. And rather than individually removing some of these grapes, which they used to do in the big houses when they had a dozen undergardeners to spend days doing it. No, <laughs> haven't got that option. So back at the time when it's flowering, I go around and tickle my grape flowers. And I rub off between a third and a half of all the flowers, uh, quite, you know, just by grabbing, tickling them, not rubbing them all off, but just to reduce the number of flowers by half. And then I get half as many fruits forming and I don't have to bother with thinning my grapes at a later stage. I've done it at the flowering stage. So it's again, thinking ahead. Uh, and that's just a mechanical problem. This is actually a hop leaf, and it's got a mildew on it. And that was because it's grown from the outside of this polytunnel into the inside through a hole, and it's in much too hot climate for it. So again, back to assessing what plants we've got, we're, we're trying to grow. If you take them too far out of their comfort zone, then they're going to have a problem. 
So hops, they're native, outdoor, and they'll go through the winter, no problem. They don't need to be indoors. And when they're indoors, they suffer. So some plants, too much monocoddling is going to give them a hard time. This is a kind of silvery uh, mildew, and this is on an apple tree. You can see the flowers have come and just gone, and the fruits are starting to fall. And this is a nice suggestion. It's if you've got apple trees, yeah, the young shoot will emerge. It's very soft and sappy, and uh, this is giving you an, an, a readout of how healthy that tree is. And this is called colour-coded pruning. Because what you do in terms of pruning is you go around a month after the leaves have emerged and you just snip off anything that doesn't look right. So actually alongside this next door there's lovely healthy glossy young leaves. They're at the same stage of growth but these ones need nipping out and that's indicating that that tree is out of balance to some degree, that it can't get enough moisture up through the roots to supply all the new, sh new growth and make it healthy. So it's, it's not a terminal problem, but in terms of pruning, it's uh, just a light pruning, just nipping off these buds, you can do it by hand, and then the tree will be happier uh, redu yeah, without the kind of problem growth. And this is one of my favourites, it's slightly out of uh, focus. This half is happy healthy leaf. This has got the peach leaf curl. So this affects peaches, apricots, nectarines, and uh, almonds as well. Um, it's a, a spore that overwinters and gets deposited on the leaves very early in the year. Uh, but I like it because it's so kind of gothic. Uh, actually, down the Huerta, we've not experienced it because it must be so warm down there, it doesn't exist. But yeah, uh, if you're growing those kind of fancy fruits, that might be a problem, but again, uh, most of the other leaves are, ha are healthy at this stage. If I leave that one on, it will recycle either this year or next year and there'll be more of it. So just picking them off, getting rid of those. And then, yeah, I've got a little bit of story with this one. <coughs> uh, some very old established growers came to me and they said, what's gone wrong with me onions? They've gone like potato blight. And with potato blight, one week they might look fine, and just a tiny little orange spots on the leaf. But if it's warm enough and humid enough, within a week or two, they'll all get knocked over uh, and get affected. And it was the same with their onion crop. And yeah, I'd never seen this as a, a disease, but I'd seen most others, and I'd heard about it. It stuck in my memory, and it was uh, smut. So smut stuck in my memory. I'm not saying anymore, but. When they brought these onions, and it's a powdery uh, mildew on the surface first, and then within a matter of hours or days, that's killed that bit of onion leaf. And once it's killed the bit around, the bit on the top's going to die. And this would be one of many where part of the solution is to grow your crop early enough. And again, it will be the hot, humid weather that we get in July mostly that, that the spores of this float around in. And again, if other people have had it and haven't dealt with it, then they'll be passing it on to you. Uh, so if I can grow an early enough crop of onions that they're forming their onion by July, then even if they get it bad, I've still got some uh, roots formed. Uh, the other suggestion, especially with onions, is to try every way of growing onions there is. So we've already put, put onion sets in the ground in the autumn, and some onion seeds that are planted out in the autumn. They'll form early next year, this year, and then spring sown sets and seed. So try every method, and also maybe in different situations. And um, this is one where, like potato blight, the potato blight comes up the country from the southwest. So it'll be in the southwest in May, and then it'll come up to the Midlands in June and July. Uh, and that's why they grow potato tubers for seed up in Scotland because the potato blight rarely gets that far. So it makes its way up the country, basically. But that's a prevailing wind question. So <coughs> if your site is open to the west, and southwest especially, that's where the potato blight blows up from. And that can also get on your tomatoes, even if they're inside a greenhouse, if your window or door is open to the west and southwest. So you have to watch out for that. And 
Here's another, this was a, uh, a stumper, and we've got netting, this is one centimetre mesh, over cabbages. That will keep out the cabbage whitefly, so that's a, an effective control of cabbage whitefly. But this plant was just not happy, and we looked in the centre, that's where we'd find aphids, let's just show you one of those. So they're, they're inside the curled up bit of leaf, which is keeping them cool and moist in the summer and they'll also be on the young growing shoot and turning the growth purple, so that's a stress response. So as soon as I glance at a plant and see purple, I think, oh, that's aphids, and without even looking any further. Back to this red cabbage, it wasn't happy, I couldn't see any problem with it. it had, we had to dig it up to find out what the problem was. And in this case, it was cabbage root moth, I think it was, root fly, which I've never seen before. But there's a little maggot inside the root, uh, working its way around the plant uh, and stopping the sap getting up to the plant. So just looking above, you couldn't tell what was wrong with it. The, 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 the mechanism of the problem wasn't apparent. So sometimes you have to actually dig down and get to the root to find out what the problem is. The other big problem with cabbages is, uh, we, we'll go to that, yeah, club root. And that can be in the soil for seven years and that, again, you, you'd see a plant die, but you wouldn't necessarily know why. But when you dig it up, you get a lumpy growth on the root, a bit like kind of brain, looks like a bit like a brain. Uh, so that was aphid. And then this was a bit of a stumper as well. Uh, broad bean, looks, it's been killed back there, but then it's grown up here. What's going on? And actually, it was just the frost that happened about two weeks beforehand. And that, like I say, killed the established leaf, the large leaf that was growing, but left the shoot alive because it had more sugar in it, more uh, like uh, antifreeze. So the shoot has then recovered and grown on, and it's just sacrificed that, that dead leaf. And that is, yeah, if you're doing good basic practice and going in the right direction on other things, <coughs> there is a suggestion to just see what happens with pests and diseases. And if you're not sure, not necessarily intervene. If you can see something, rub it off. But if you're not sure what's happened, uh, there might be another reason. And not necessarily to have to do every, something about every single you know, problem. So it looks, again, cosmetically a bit of a mess. But by the time the beans actually form, months later, that, that'll be fine as a plant. And here's another one uh, talking about yeah, vermin and... Vol uh, uh, this is actually a young apple in about July, so it's already formed quite a decent size, and this one has got a bit of a blush on it, and then something that's very hungry like a pigeon has come along, saw the red, associated with that with food, and pecked away at it, but actually it's not ripe at all, so it's gone away. So again, in that case, have I got something that's going to come back and get the rest? No. It was just tasting and trying apple. If that, if that was a good one, it might have gone to the others, but it wasn't ready, so that wouldn't be a problem that's going to transfer. Uh, calendula, just putting that in as a good companion plant, we'll think about that a bit more next, next week. Back to making sure that pollination happens, uh, get the bees in and around and about. Ah, this is the floating fleece, it's polypropylene spun mesh. Uh, they fire lines of, of this fibre onto a surface until it's pore space is enough to allow moisture and air to pass through it, but not bugs. And I use this over carrot fly, uh, over carrots to stop carrot fly getting in. In this case, it's being used to keep squash plants a little bit warmer under the fleece. So keeping things warm and then excluding carrot fly is fine use for this stuff. Uh, it only tends to be used once, and then the second time it's got holes in, so it's big holes, so it's too late to use again. But this second use, in, t in this case, of warming it, keeping plants warm underneath it. But if you try to put that over all your crops, it's going to produce luscious growth, and that might actually make those plants more vulnerable to pest and disease. And the example of that would be, if I have put this on over carrots, but I've trapped aphids inside there and they're multiplying away at a fast rate because it's warm and I can't see them then I could create a problem for myself 
And that's what I was saying about kind of yeah, being honest about your own practice. And it might well have been you that what did it, you know. Uh, spiders, I like spiders, keep them around. And again, earthworms, and just these are three mating earthworms. All three of them mating all at once. Uh, keeping soil good. A balance of wildlife, a uh, you know, little place for birds in the shed. Uh, yeah, keeping. And then just last picture uh, this huge caterpillar, well, it's about an inch too long, that was actually up on the peaks, up on the, the heather in the middle of summer. If you go up there in the middle of summer, there's more life going on up on the tops than there is anywhere else because it's got a very short growing season. Everything has, has to happen really quickly, so the insects have to multiply really quickly. And that probably produced elephant hawk moth. I've seen a hummingbird hawk moth as well, and I'm sure I, saw, I, I thought it was a hummingbird when I saw it, but it could only have been a hummingbird hawk moth. Can you turn the lights on again? So I've said most of what I'm um, thinking about there. Uh, just one more before we go, a tactile experience. Just pull a bit of that out. And, yeah, have a share of some of those. I'll refer back to this again in a week or two's time. But, yeah, just sending around a couple of samples. Rub it and pass it quick, quick, quick. Pass that one on in a minute. And what I've brought on is two substances that I use for pest control. And I don't use much apart from these two substances. You can use uh, washing up liquid, especially uh, a sound one like Ecova, maybe not fairy liquid. Uh, but that will, uh, that's useful for, as a carrier. So rather than just putting substances in water, if they've got a drop of uh, Ecova, washing up liquid, that will actually help the liquid to stick on. So rather than just flushing straight off the leaf, a little bit of detergent in the water will help it to spread and stick. Mm -hmm. and, and, and then these two substances I tend to use according to the weather. And one of them is horsetail, which is a very ancient, it's one of these non-flowering plants, and it's related to the club mosses, like the stumps they've got in the botanical gardens. So they used to be trees. This stuff was collected from uh, one of the mill ponds in Rivlin Valley. And I'd like you to just hold it next to your ear and crush it. And can you hear it crackle? Mm -hmm. All right. Now that is uh, silica, crystals of silica. And what I do with this is boil it up quite hard for about 20 minutes, make a tea out of it. And that will have dissolved crystals of silica in it. And the aim is, if we've had cool, moist weather in the summer, well, the moisture is going to extend growth, but there's not enough sun to harden off all the leaves that fall. And this stuff, the silica crystals, when they're sprayed onto a leaf surface, they block up the holes in the leaf. Not completely, the plant can still breathe, so it doesn't harm the plant in any way, but that is effectively doing what sunlight would do. So the effect of sunlight baking a leaf means the cells contract and the pores, the, the holes in the leaf, the stomata, are smaller. And you can get a similar effect by spraying horsetail on and then with your firmer leaf that's been either sunlight or horsetail, the aphids can't get their, their noses into the holes that they'd usually use to drink the sap out of. So this is replacement sunlight, horsetail. And then the other one, anybody brave enough to just try a little taste of it? Don't put it in your mouth. Just get a little bit of it on your, uh, on your tongue. This is cassia. It's a very bitter wood. Just to get you ready for what you're going to experience. It's very bitter. And this is not enough to kill uh, aphids and small bugs, and like the red spider mite. But it'll put them off. Have you tasted it? Yeah. Nobody's gone, ah! <laughs> but that's intensely bitter. And made a spray, again, boiling up and sprayed on. 
when do we get a problem with these aphids and these sap, sap, sucking bugs? Extremely hot weather. <coughs> so if we've had enough sun, uh, that's because partly they're going to proliferate. The warmer the weather and the longer the days, the quicker they can reproduce, have another generation. And yeah, if you sp oh, Asha needs a drink after that. Well, now I've got to go. <coughs> okay. Can't go at 26 past that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's alternating. If we get cooler, wetter weather in the summer, I'll use the horsetail to replace the sunlight. If we get hot weather that's good for the aphid-type bugs to multiply, then I'll spray the cassia, maybe with a bit of uh, seaweed, uh, sorry, a bit of uh, washing up liquid. And that's enough to dissuade, put off, knock back, and reduce the number of pests without having to actually eradicate them more. Back to hand rubbing. So I've not got time to go through the chart that I've got here. That would take another hour. But these are all the common insects, diseases and problems I've come across and which crops I found particularly prone and this will be good general basis if you're aware of this lot you should be forewarned for what will come uh, what the symptoms are that you notice what the actual cause is and again trying to address the cause of a problem because there is a terrible syndrome about just treating the symptoms and not addressing the cause. Similar to medicine, you want to go to your doctor to get cured of the cause, not, not to have it recur a bit later on, and what treatments are available for those. And I'll just finish by mentioning the last group here, the animals. And a lot of these things would be vermin, like pigeons and rats and mice. Uh, oh, and yeah, actually, livestock. These are problems that we get a lot more in the countryside, but we're free of in the city. So we've got a real advantage growing in the city because we haven't got plagues of wabbits eating all our crop and making holes in it. What? However, we have got the, the unnamed pest on here, which is the humans, the two-legged pests. <laughs> That'll do for today. <laughs>